All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the bullpen. Let's put it up in the bullpen today. This is an update to a story. Tatiana, Tatiana Fano, if you remember, filed criminal charges. The enhancement, the enhancements made it a felony assault on a minor. The Round Rock ISD police held onto the completed investigation file without turning it over to the DA for six months. When it finally went before a grand jury, it came back no warrant. The grand jury sided with Thomas that his actions were justified on the premise it was self defense, talking about the teacher that attacked. Because the two female teachers stated that Quentin, the kid, had attacked them, despite that the video showed the statement was a lie. Both female teachers remained at the school, yet Jacob Thomas, his teacher credentials remain intact. He voluntarily resigned at the end of the school year and could be teaching or working with children anywhere. At the end of the day, he was found guilty of child abuse by two separate governmental agencies, but was not fired. He was not charged. No repercussions were levied against him for the trauma he caused. Tatiana's son, Quentin. Quentin and Tatiana took to the Capitol with disability rights. Let's put a picture up of uh, disability rights of Texas to pursue legislation that makes schools safer for children. They haven't gotten an apology from the district, nothing. They have not seen any changes. They never received a dime in any compensation. There has not been any justice for Q. We have Q and his mom, Tatiana, both on the show today. Thank you both for joining us on Indisputable. How are you? Well, good. Thank you. Thank you for being here. I'm very sorry this happened. What I would like to do um, is get an overview of the experience, what happened in your own words, and we will dissect what should have happened afterwards, but did not. And uh, Tatiana, I'll start with you. Yeah, so after you aired our um, our story, um, uh, Texas Department of Family Protection Services came back and with no new information and changed the ruling of their abuse finding to um, substantiated abuse. So they did find reason to believe that there was abuse um, based on no new evidence. So I'm not sure why they, they randomly just changed it. Um, I'm assuming it's because of the, the, the media coverage of the case. And um, so I, <laughs> and with that letter, nothing happened. Um, we have a, a principal who was found guilty of child abuse. Um, TEA came back and found that his actions were very abusive as well. And um, as far as I know, TEA never took his credentials. So he's still free to teach, even despite everything. It's unbelievable. Um, Q, are you able to give us some contextualization, some some experiential background as to what you went through and how it transpired? Like during the incident or? Yes, during, during the incident in particular. Right, so when I was going, I was walking from the classroom because it was something about um, something about a computer, I don't exactly remember that much anymore. So I got a little angry, um, they escorted me out the room. The entire time, my uh, entire time, my hands were in my pockets. Um, to Miss Manzi and Miss York, both of them escorted me by my arms to the cool down room. And then from the cool down room to the hallway, um, Again, I'm, I don't really remember all that much, but they had brought me into the cool down room. And then from the cool down room, I stayed in there for about 20, 25 minutes, I think. And I had my hands in my pockets still during the whole thing. So the two female staff walked out and then another male staff, Mr. Thomas, um, 
I came in and I was following them out since I was already calm and everything. And he had taken me by my left shoulder and thrown me into the wall. Wow. Mr. Stefano, when you first received the news about this, um, it was presented to you in an entirely different way than it actually happened. It yeah. was exposed later, the truth, yeah. uh, that your son did absolutely nothing to provoke an attack as was suggested, as was stated. Uh, he was completely innocent. So tell us about your experience after you get this information. Um, it goes from crazy to crazier. Okay. So I got a phone call. Um, I guess they were still in the middle of, a, of the crisis. And they they gave me a rundown of, of what was happening and um, asked me to come pick them up from school. Um, they didn't feel safe to put them on the school bus. Um, I was trying to get coverage for my classroom so that I could leave um, to come pick him up from his school. And then they called me back at about about 10 minutes later and said, well, um, he's calmed down and we feel like he's safe enough to put up, put him on the bus. Don't worry about it. Um, he, he'll, we'll send him home. Um, and on the phone, they didn't say anything to me about any head injuries or anything. It was when I got the email later that evening and I was going over the email with Clinton, um, that it was, it, it said that he fell and hit his head on a wall. Um, and Quentin was like, no mom, that is not what happened. They threw me into a wall. Um, I was, being an educator myself, I, I find that very hard to believe. Like why would they, there's cameras everywhere. Why, nobody's gonna pick up a kid at school and throw them, right? Like that's, we don't, we don't throw children. Um, but I have to do my due diligence as a parent. If my son is making an accusation, it's my job to, to, to check. So I requested the, the video footage and um, it took about almost two weeks for me to see the footage. Um, when they showed it to me, I was blown away. I was like, the Jackie Hartle um, is the, the special education director. Um, she was the one who wrote the original email the, and the one who I talked with subsequently. And um, it was Hartle and another lady via um, an internet conversation that they that I was able to watch the video and both of the teachers looked like they were going to cry or the admins looked like they were going to cry when they were watching me watch this video. Like, there, you cannot watch the video and not, it, it will, your heart will fall out. Like, yeah. it, it's ridiculous. Um, but I, I didn't have anything to say. There was nothing I could say that was, there was nothing that I could say. So I, I just was like, I'm going to end the call. And I will follow up via email. I got myself an attorney, um, David Bunger, and um, he worked with us. I made, I made a, we made requests for some changes to be made at the school level. Um, that more training was put into place for mandated reporting um, for. Um, restraints for proper use of restraints um, and that when a child is in crisis that they can be checked up on by a neutral third party um, because in Quentin's instance in the incident I think what was particularly egregious was that he after the incident, he had to sit in the office and talk about the crisis with Jacob Thomas. And Quentin was made to apologize to Jacob Thomas in the office um, directly after the crisis. Um, and so when Quentin was trying to make the outcry of abuse, um, even in the video, you can hear him saying, you threw me into an effing wall, you threw me into a wall. Um, and those, so those two teachers, the two female teachers heard him making that outcry, but they didn't report it. And then 
he went to, into the office where the uh, principal basically gaslit him and said, hey, that didn't happen. You're lying. That's not what happened. Um, and made Quentin apologize. So let me go to uh, Quentin. Um, and thank you for that, that context. Uh, Q, you know you did not do anything wrong. But at this point, there's an emerging narrative of allegedly responsible adults all saying that you did, including the authority, the principal. And you're in this position where you're basically being told you have to apologize because you did something wrong. What were you feeling at that time, Q? I really don't remember much after I hit the wall. Wow. Okay. Was there anything that transpired before the attack we see on video that would indicate some kind of bias or aggression specifically toward you? Did anything like that happen to where you say you would say, if anybody was going to do that, it would have been that person and that person? Yeah, he'd always had kind of a grudge against me since I had been transferred to that school. Like since I started, he'd always had that kind of grudge. Um, and all, everyone knows him to be kind of hot headed, aggressive. Um, not a lot of the students there liked him, wanted to be near him. He was just not a person to be around. Ms. Alfano, let me pose this next question to you. When you watch that video, obviously it's an emotional thing. I'm a parent. I can't imagine watching a video like that of my child. Um, you being in education, you understand the mandates that are involved. There's a mandate to report child abuse in the state of Texas. It's there. Yes. Uh, you can right. You can only have an effective mandate if you have a effective enforcement of the mandate. So tell us where. Did the breakdown happen? Why don't we see a massive enforcement of the uh, mandate as it relates to child abuse that was witnessed and known, generally known at the institution? Well, who? I think we've got a, we've got a whole host of problems at Round Rock. Um, it, it appears because we've got what what appears to be a culture of abuse um, and cover up. From the top down, um, Dr. Azaiz included, um, and with within the school districts over here, each school district has their own police. So it's not Round Rock Police Department that handled Clinton's case. It was Round Rock Independent School District Police mm. Clinton's case. So this police, these these police officers are in the. They have offices in the schools. So they're they're friends, they're buddy buddies with the teachers that they see every day, um, which is which is good in a lot of ways. There's there's obviously a lot of of, of uh, pros to that. If you're if you're going to have good relations with police and students, having them there in the school frequently being seen, that that's good. But. Um, it, it's like the fox guarding the hen house. It's a, yeah. and it's a Incestuous. You can't have. Um, you you can't expect them to be completely neutral when investigating this and handing it over. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and what you say makes makes perfect sense. It it, it seems to be a very ironic scenario, um, especially when the police who work for the school system should be investigating uh, not only teachers but possibly the principal of an institution. Um, that's rarely going to actually happen, as it stands yeah. now. Who's been held accountable? Children. Say that one more time. They're usually investigating the children, usually right. the from the children, not the teachers. So right. Who's been held accountable? At what no. levels have people been held? Nobody's been held accountable. Uh, there no. is there is some notation on the record as far as what people have concluded uh, that have looked at this, right? But no actual disciplinary dynamic for anybody. None, absolutely none. Um, so he he can't be charged, uh, double jeopardy. He can't be charged. Um, and yes, he was found guilty of child abuse, but it's not up to um, Texas Def uh, Department of Family Protective Services to um, levy any type of punishments against him. Mm. So 
and I, what what go, what happens after that? If somebody's found guilty of child abuse. Apparently nothing. Wow. Uh, yeah. So TEA decided that he was found to be abusive as well, but they did not take his um, teaching credentials. So um, he doesn't have any type of. Um, if you do a background check, he's not gonna pull up anything on his background um, and he still has his teaching credentials. So he could be anywhere working with children anywhere. You know, this is why media is important. As I say often, what the court of law cannot do, the court of public opinion can. We are glad that you have the opportunity to tell your story. Um, Q, very, very thankful. As I said before the interview, um, I appreciate your leadership. It takes courage to be able to authentically speak your own experience and your own truth. Q, if there's anything um, you would like to say to young people across the country who may be experiencing adverse relationships or even abuse from an adult in particular in the school system, what would you say to them? I think it's always important to reach out to the right people, see exactly what you can do or what you can have handled. I think it's important that you always have someone that you can trust, tell someone that you can rely upon. Some something like if something goes wrong, there's always a backup. I think that's important. Very well said, Q. Very well said. Um, and to Miss Afano, as an educator, what would you say to fellow educators? in similar situations where they are aware of abuse, but not reporting it. You, you, you can't call yourself an educator. Um, there's mandated reporting is a huge part of what we do. That's right. Um, it's crucial that keeping the children safe is, is, is what we're here for. Um, I mean, educating an injured child is, how are they going to learn? That's right. Um, so if you see something, say something. And I, I do know that there's problems within CPS. Um, so many problems, <laughs> even as our own case brought out, but it, it, it has to be investigated. Um, and as awful as it is, that's really the only, the only thing that was done. <laughs> In the end, the only thing that was actually done right for Quentin was he was found guilty of abuse. And that was done by. So, I mean, if it wasn't for that, I don't have anything else? Yeah. All right. Well, um, we're going to continue to stay on top of this. There may be a response after this interview. Um, and if so, our team will reach back out to you uh, to see your satisfaction or lack thereof with whatever response may come. We appreciate you both. Thank you for being on Indisputable. Thank you. Thank you.